So obviously there's been a lot said on social media about the village of Seville B, where we are right now, and the incident that happened with Hukumuri the male leopard. So we've come to Seville to speak to the people on the ground who are directly affected by wildlife, coming out of protected areas, preying on their livestock, and putting their children in danger. It's very important that we always consider both sides of the story. And there's that wonderful old adage, is don't judge someone till you've walked a mile in their shoes. We're hoping to give everyone out there a much better understanding of what it's like to live in the communities. And we're very, very lucky. The community's been incredibly welcoming, especially Tulani, uh, Nguanyama. Tulani, the male lion. Tulani, who eats meat. Yeah. Uh, who's uh, been helping us and guiding us through the community and making sure we talk to the right people to tell you guys the true story. Hello, uh, my name is Tulani. I'm from Seville, which is the village that we are in now. And today we are filming this uh, Hukumori document. And we are in the lady where the house, the, the leopard was shot. And my job for this documentary is to translate the language, which is Songa. And the background of my story, I'm also a filmmaker. I just studied filmmaking in Cape Town for two years, so I'm here to do the transla translator for our, our people in the community. So thank you so much. Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight on this discussion about human wildlife conflict. We have an incredible group of people with us this evening uh, to help guide us through what can sometimes be very muddy waters. And a lot of compassion and understanding needs to happen from both sides for these situations to be carefully uh, dealt with in the right way. So um, we've got Michelle Girardin, who has uh, been in this industry for, sure, before I was born. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we've got Tulani Nguanyama from Civil B Village itself. Uh, Tulani has been instrumental in helping us, um, introducing us to the community members. And he actually lives in that community um, where the unfortunate incident took place. And then uh, Mike Grover. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. No, pleasure. And Mike's obviously worked both in the private sector, inside the reserves, and uh, in the communities uh, in different projects with NGOs. So very, very excited to have them all on board. And again, thank you to all of you for getting your questions in. Now, we will take some questions live, but most of the questions um, we have taken from the app. So if we don't get to your question, there were so many, and, there was so, and a lot of them were really, really great. Um, we do apologize. We'll try to get through as much as possible in the time we have. Now... There's a, an interesting one from Gati, first up, um, and it, 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 for me it's quite interesting having lived and worked in both Kenya and South Africa. Uh, and Gati says, I wonder how communities could have more income from tourism. In Kenya, there's the Ma Trust, which helps community members sell their products, their visits to Maasai villages and tours of the traditional way of life, uh, charities um, who collect for dogs and bomas. Um, why are some of these not being used in South Africa? And other countries? I think there are. So I, I think there definitely are NGOs that work both inside and outside. Um, a lot of the lodges have got their own NGOs. Um, there's a number of NGOs working on the outside. 
in terms of the human well-being. Um, so not just animals, there's the state veterinary department that does a lot of great work and the universities that do, do research. But um, I guess the, the main sort of reason why you don't see it is because there's a fence that divides the two. So it's kind of inside and outside. And, and South Africa is, is one of the only countries in Africa that has that, that really sharp divide of both inside and outside. And that's probably what creates the, the misconception in many ways. So there is, there is, as I said, there's a huge amount of work that is happening um, on various different levels. I also think it's just a little bit less public than in Kenya. Yeah. Uh, it is it is not so Instagram friendly um, to, to actually say it. Mm -hmm. So the Messiah, obviously, with their bright red robes that are behind us and stuff, and they're still all dressed traditionally, it makes quite a nice thing from a from a tourist point of view to go visit in that. Where there is and with all the cattle and that, where there's a lot of the communities, yeah, it's, it's, it's subsistence agriculture, it's people working hard in the fields, it's, it's, it's not Instagram friendly, I, I would also think, is, is a thing. So there are huge amounts of charities and, 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 and um, organizations that are working on ensuring um, the health of the community and, and, and the reserves nearby. Now, just a little fact, I know the Kenyans are going to probably shoot me for this, but um, due to various different things since mid-1960, Kenya has actually lost 80% of its wildlife, um, mostly to uh, well, uh, agriculture, whether South Africa has probably gained 60% more than it had in the 60s. And that's due to private ownership of land, private ownership of animals, which is a, <laughs> a very complicated topic, but probably not for tonight. Um, so, one system, and I don't think one solution is right for, what might be right for Kenya might not be right for us. Yeah, I think that the, you know, there's, uh, there's so many models uh, that have, have evolved over the years and having been involved since the, the early 1980s, um, the uh, discussion around beneficiation uh, of communities that adjoin protected areas has always uh, been seen as complex, challenging. We come out of the, the years of apartheid with all its uh, uh, terrible influences, etc., and I think the, the, the models, there's no one model that can, that can um, serve us all. A prime example that uh, your dad, uh, Kevin, was instrumental in setting up was the PINDA model, as I call it, with Conservation Corporation, of how they did that. Uh, but you can't just take the PINDA model and say, OK, it can now work in Botswana. Or you take the Kenya model that uh, Grady is talking about. I think the beneficiation, and I hear Mike when he talks about NGOs, and, and I think the NGOs play a great role, but it's not really... NGOs. I think there, there, there is a need, um, it's improved over the years, of establishing businesses rather than merely depending on work what NGOs uh, do, in my opinion. And uh, communities themselves in terms of enabling themselves through the help of NGOs. But I think that ultimately one must look towards a, um, not stand alone, but the development of ownership of businesses, not merely as the result of... Uh, goodwill or charity handout. handout i don't believe in that concept yeah. and i think if you look at the south african model the closed model uh, you drive between hazy view and paul kruger gate 30 years ago to today it's very different in mm. terms of if you look at the development of housing yeah. um, there has to be have been some influence of protected areas and other economic drivers but most certainly the protected areas like the sabi sand and uh, etc which have resulted in an improvement in the lives of, of, of adjoining communities. I mean, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there, was, there wasn't electricity, let yes, alone correct. water and yeah. stuff like that. Now, yeah. those issues still exist, particularly in, the, in the, the outlying communities, but there has been a massive improvement in general. Uh, but again, it's, it's not one, you can't fix everything with, there's no, no one solution. No, there's no one solution. Uh, I'm sure even in Tulani's lifetime, he's, you've seen an increase in the number of people living there, the number of houses being built. Uh, there's a, a huge increase in, in the number of people, but it's, it's also people that are willing to stay in that area because they have some sort of income. So it, there's a, a decline in people traveling and, and being migrant workers because they want to stay uh, locally. I mean, Tulani, You've had a, a mix of both where you've traveled to the city to go and study, but you've come back to, to work in, in your own area. Yeah. yeah, so basically it's all about, like, I love being in my area. I love being close to the game reserve since I grew up there. And I love being around in March. So actually they say, 
change and grow around the earth. Yeah. Mm. And, and there's people like Tulani of the next generation who, who are vital in terms of changing the mindsets mm. about the leopard is bad because it eats goats rather to, well, the leopard might eat a goat, but also there are other benefits that the leopard brings to the, the community as a whole. Mm. I think, Brenda, if I can just quickly just talk about benef- benefits. Um, it's quite interesting. You see people coming to a protected area in the greater Kruger and uh, be they international or South Africans. And as soon as it gets dark and people are on a night drive and they look out and they look to the west and they see lights. And often you hear guests saying, oh, it's a pity that there are lights out there. My response is actually those people out there until President Mandela became president, they did not have electricity, so they cooked on using firewood, utilizing of, 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 of scarce resources, etc. So when a new government came in under the leadership of President Mandela and gave electricity, of course they're going to take it because it's improving. And, you know, once you explain it that way to a tourist who has everything at a flick of a switch back home, it kind of changes. The, actually, you know what, you're right. Yes, it would be nice to be in a wilderness, inverted commas, area. But the benefits of um, not just protected areas, but it's part and parcel economics, uh, it's great to see that people have, have electricity now, even if it might upset you as a tourist in seeing lights outside on the western horizon. And you have the ability to look east and see darkness yeah. and, yeah. and enjoy yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. it's all about perspective. Yeah, correct. Um, so we've got another question here, which is an interesting one from Carla B. Due to the fact that Kamui was habituated to vehicles and being around people to a certain degree, do you think that had any an effect on his behavior in, in terms of how he behaved in the village to hunt livestock? He didn't seem to have the same fear as people as a normal unhabituated leopard would have. Um, also, it was reported that he killed several livestock and a, do- a dog. So he's been going into the village on multiple occasions. This wasn't a one-time thing. So, yes, um, I mean, to a degree... It is one of those things we habituate the animals so we can enjoy it, but now they go to an area. I, I, I haven't seen too much, Mike, you might have had a bit more experience in Tulani. I mean, you, the hyenas and, and leopards that I haven't really seen too many in the community. Well, areas. Do they behave differently? I don't, I think Okamori would still sneak around. Yeah, so habituation is an interesting thing because yeah. it's habituation to a c- circumstance yeah. rather than to a, the presence of a human necessarily. Yeah. So you see it with lions, that when you're on foot, they'll run away. a lot of the time they'll put their head up and then run off. Or there are certain leopards that feel comfortable, but they probably only feel comfortable around a camp where they've grown up. Yeah. You you move out to outside of the reserve, and it's a very different story, very different smell. There's lots of noise, motion, uh, uh, noise, and stuff like that. So for me, I don't think it's necessarily a habituation. It may have played a part in the fact that he felt comfortable to to stick around, like. Yeah, maybe that made it easier for, for them to shoot him or maybe that, to find him. That, that's a possibility. But in terms of him coming out, uh, I think it was more a matter of an old nine-year-old male losing his territory. He's been on the run for the last few months. He's got one eye. He had a fight with a war dog. With the war dog. Like he's, he's moving out. And, and that's uh, the irony of it all is if, if we had seen Tingana and him fighting and, and Tingana had killed him, we would have said geez this is nature and it's so sad but that's what happens. that's what it is it's yeah. territory and people uh, or not people um people are one element of territory we we, yes. we don't see ourselves as part of the ecosystem and we should yeah the, one of the big but well, the part that takes up the most of the ecosystem yeah we do take a, a big part and and i think that's one of the blessings of of the habituation is that you can have leopards moving through unscathed and moving on. Yeah. A lot of those leopards have not learned to hunt livestock. Mm-hmm. So, so they don't know. I mean, anyone that knows and follows the stories of leopards, they learn certain traits and how to kill warthog from their mother or their father. Yeah. Um, and they, they learn those traits. And so killing livestock is not a natural sort of thing. It's, a, it's an opportunistic... So, and I think in Hukumuri's case, a necessity thing. Absolutely, I would, so I would definitely think he's, that. He's been yeah. pushed by a tortoise pan, which is a new male, and, and there's Muluati, Muluati Tingana. Tingana, and yeah. forget, he moved then into the Manileti. Yeah. We don't know what leopards are sitting there, but mm. there's, there's already males yeah. holding yeah. territory there. Correct. And, and if he'd kept going further east, he would have just kept hitting more leopards. Mm. The further he went towards Kruger, there's, mm. there's more leopards. Mm. So that only left him the result of going to the west, 
and that was into the communities. Now, we're going to talk about that in a second, but just so everyone realizes from Mama Motonsi's house to where they found and shot him was less than 60 meters during the day. He was lying up in a thicket, yeah. but he was 60 meters from where her kids were playing. Yeah. And, and, and it, when she spoke to us, that was her biggest fear. It wasn't the loss of a Correct. goat. Mm. It's, it's her children. Yeah, the potential... Uh, yeah, I think that, that's a different perspective. And I mean, it was interesting to read um, on the various media platforms uh, following the unfortunate uh, incident, the focus on the personae of Hukamuri, which is understandable, and I, uh, I understand that. And it was really only when uh, Africa Geographic and uh, yourselves went out and suddenly a, a name, the Matonsi family, who had been directly affected, yeah. were mentioned, that suddenly there was an awareness of the impact of what had happened prior to him being euthanized. And it, it's quite an interesting thing because, yeah, we've all got kids. Think about it. That if, what would I have done? Yeah. Before I mean, we, we've we've lived inside uh, the Sabi sand, well, and uh, Mark's had a uh, yeah, you can nip it around our house all the yes. time, and it, and it's something that you you do worry about. Yeah. And so I, I think that's where it, it becomes a difficulty is is some of the comments that were made about it, and mm. there was a lot of anger towards the reason why mm. Hukumuri was shot or the the people that shot him, and that, and that's not fair. That's no, not they fair. were doing their job. They were doing their job. Yeah. They they were following protocols. The community did everything right. They informed the, the authorities. Mm -hmm. The authorities came there, and even if they'd caught him, then what? Where? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in, in those circumstances, so um, I know that it was an option to try and see if they could dart him. They went and assessed it, and, and that wasn't an option. He was in the thicket, he was amongst a lot of people. A dart takes three to four minutes to, to take effect. A lot if of not damage. Longer. Yeah, and it can do a lot minutes. of damage there. So, so these are all the things that, when you look at the broader picture, mm. Conservation, while it's all about species and, and individuals in the long run, it's about conserving the entire area, and sometimes these tough decisions have to be made. And, I mean, it just, this happens probably every day somewhere in Africa. Correct. It's just because it was Hukumuri that it, mm. it, it became a social media... Yeah, a storm. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, an interesting point you make, because... It'd be interesting to find out from uh, the authorities uh, what in the last three months have they had to deal with uh, outside the protected areas in terms of uh, having to deal with um, the uh, extremists, euthanize animals. How many animals have they had to either dart or euthanize in the last six months? Uh, I think we would be quite amazed at the amount of incidents where lions, I mean, lions have broken out and have been brought, in, been brought back in and broke out again and, and two lions were shot. Um, uh, uh, surrounding the protected areas, including Manjaleti, etc. Um, in the last two, two and a half months. Um, <laughs> Everyone can beat Brian yeah. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> after telling us to put our cell phones on uh, silence, uh, we can beat yeah. the cameraman afterwards. Um, you know, but seriously, that... Um, I know of, of other animals that have to be yeah. euthanized, but they did not have the profile of this persona named Hukumuri. So the response uh, is different and understandable, uh, the response. But this is something that goes on, as you said, Brent, it goes on throughout Africa on a daily basis. And you've got to realize that this, in a way, is actually a positive conservation story. The fact, and, and, I, and I'm not saying having to euthanize animals is positive, yeah. but the fact is that the Greater Kruger, the APNR, Manuleti, Savi Sands, are doing such a good job in terms of managing the predator populations and whatnot that there is no space left for a nine-year-old male leopard. So he is forced out. And it's not like you're losing a leopard. That means there's a younger, fitter, healthier male that has taken his place, that has come from somewhere else. So it, I mean, it, it's, it, it's as, <coughs> as I know a lot of you chat with my dad on the app here. Um, and what is it... Um, Many people suggest that trophy hunting or poaching are the biggest threats. But in general, it's a lack of habitat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Correct. Lack of space. Poaching yeah. outside of very s certain species, such as rhino and pangolin, every other, most species are, are, are confined by us, how far we've spread. 
And I mean, we've had discussions about this. I mean, we, we did it on after that nonsense Tiger King uh, nut job. We, we worked out, we went and worked out the average cost of what it is costing to feed the lions and tigers. We didn't even go into panthers and jaguars and mountain lions. Just the lions and tigers that are registered legal in America a year. And it was something like $100 million. Yeah, yeah. Now, $100 million into either range expansion, community improvement, yeah. upgrades, etc. $100 million in Africa goes a hell of a lot longer than it, further than it goes in the States. Well, $100 million, but the time and energy that's been spent on, on this individual circumstance. And, and I think that's, yeah. that's the other thing, is that, Mish, you were saying how many um, other animals have got out. Mm. There's a, a working group that, that does try and quantify that and they try and report mm. all of that and, and I can say from seeing the figures that it's it's a small, small number. You'll be surprised to it's within the last mm. sort of six months there's been a handful of incidents, but there's been probably twenty to thirty potential incidents and incidents that the animals moved out and yeah. moved back in and false tracks and all sorts of things. So I think that that's the other part of it is that sometimes the decision gets made because the the, the anti-poaching rangers that went out to, to do their job from MTPA are also working a whole bunch of other stuff sure. and, and they had, had to make a decision as to the timing that was, it's going to take, are they going to dart this animal, is it going to come back in, it's the third time that mm. it's come it's out and killed. Yeah. So, so the chances of it being rehabilitated or moving it somewhere else and then Just being it okay, it's, it's not, yeah. not going to... And again, it's a very different thing if, you were, if we were looking at a two-year-old leopard that was just sure. trying to set up territory. There are places that you could, could move an animal like that, in theory, that, as you were saying, there's some stuff between South Africa and Mozambique. And, mm. But a nine-year-old leopard is just he's sort of at the end of the, end of sort of the wrong end of, yeah. end of his life. Yeah. Um, the cost and the benefit of moving an animal like that doesn't actually make sense. And uh, these people, uh, the, the conservation organizations, the MT, MTPA, all them have to make some very difficult decisions. So, yes, a two year old leopard, it might be worth, he might be able to go on and develop a territory of his own mm. sire. Mm. A nine year old is probably going to get killed by another leopard in whatever area you put him in. Yeah. Or he's going to run away from there into another community. Mm. And I mean, this doesn't only go down to leopards. And um, so, Hokumuri is basically been the one who, who brought this all together. Mm -hmm. But if you chat to Tulani, what's a much bigger problem than a leopard? Uh, there are also hyenas that come in from the community, which is a big problem to the community because like, well, pe some people really don't understand about animals and then obviously it can kill our livestock, it can mm -hmm. kill our goats, it can kill, which is a problem. Us as a people in the community so are depending on their livestock. So. I understand that people are questioning why should we, like animals are being killed or something. But like the bigger issue is, let's think about the people in the community who mm. they have lost their livestock. Because us as a community, being close to the, the, the borders, we are depending most on livestock animals. Mm. And then beside animals, we also have like kids that are going to the farms and they look after their animals. What, what, what will happen if one of those like animals kills the kids. So mm. it's all about mm. our kids. It's all about our livestock. I understand the issues of animals. I'm a photographer. I love livestock. I love animals. But like my bigger fear is what will happen if one day it kills one of the child in the community. What will happen about that? And the community's reaction yeah. will not be like they did this time. The correct. Yeah. So, I mean, then you start, people will start taking the law, so to speak, into their own hands. Absolutely. And that's why things like this need to be dealt with quickly and, and efficiently. And I think in most cases, if no one did anything wrong here. He was out, he'd come out multiple times to the same lady's house, killed a bunch of animals. Whether he went back into the Manileti or not, I mean, mm -hmm. it's difficult. The grass is yeah. mm -hmm. taller than me at the moment, tracking is near impossible. But their, their kids there, they were there. I mean, yeah. and it's seven o'clock in the evening, people are outside, it's yeah. nice time in the evening to sit outside, and that's when he was coming in, as soon as that, that the dusk hours when she yeah. saw him for the first time. Um, just one quick thing from Noel here. Noel, there was a person who said Hukumuri was lured into the village by a poacher. 
I'm not going to say his name on this, but someone should hit him with a very big stick. Yeah. If he was close to me, I would take my giraffe leg bone and belt him with it. Because he is just causing absolute nonsense. And he's doing all oh, these big mouse running up behind Brian's head. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but he, he is actually doing everyone a disservice. Um, you know who you are. I hope you're watching. Yeah, I think that, that, that for me, uh, on the afternoon when uh, this... Uh, news of, uh, at that stage, unidentified uh, leopard had been uh, euthanized. Uh, I was amazed at what was coming out and uh, organizations were slated uh, quite wrongly, which was proved later. I talk about the Sabi Sands where uh, on that day uh, I happened to phone the, uh, the CEO and, uh, and uh, Ian uh, Olifir, the, the ecologist, who didn't know about this thing at all because it had happened two weeks prior, but nobody knew about it. No. And what was said about the, the A, um, a poacher inside the Saudi sand, luring, etc., etc., which was proved to be false thereafter. And one, there are statements from both the Saudi sand, which vindicated, and also from the, the communities, vindicating from a Saudi sand point of view. And on MTPA, who finally came out and acknowledged that a leopard uh, had been uh, euthanized because it had, uh, it had killed stock outside of, of the Matonsi, Matonsi family. But unfortunately, and understand, and I think this is where the, uh, the uh, evolution of the persona of an individual animal, in this case, Hukumori, sometimes is challenging because uh, it creates a focus on, on that particular animal, rightly or wrongly so. Um, it has positive and negative. But it kind of, it, it created such a, a whirlwind and so much input on, on various platforms. Um, I understand it that, and, and, and understand why people do it, but I think it was the, the authorities were vindicated because they're the ones that are in the firing line from, from communities. Uh, and I'm glad that the vindication was, uh, was forthcoming because what was said on platforms, people have the right to, to vent. But I think what, people must be careful sometimes until, inverted commas, the facts Come exactly. Mm. Yeah. And I'm just going to ask everyone, please just be nice to each other on the chats. I see there's a bit of um, um, fight evolving. Uh, Pam, Anatolian, I'm not going to get into it. Uh, uh, Anatolian shepherds um, probably wouldn't work in this scenario. So look, it's possible, but it's, yeah. a, it's more complicated than just putting a dog there. It, it's a lot more complicated than just putting a dog there. So, so it's been... Uh, tried out by a number of different NGOs, um, mainly sort of in the Karoo area where you've got smaller uh, predators like small leopard, um, caracal, jackal, those sorts of things. So, and, and the Anatolians actually live with their, the sheep. Exactly. Um, so it, it's tough. Like the circumstance that we have in, in our area, it's cattle. So it's slightly different that, that the cattle are around, the goats hang around the village and that Anatolian isn't necessarily out in the, in the pastures with them. You have to think of the veterinary costs for that Anatolian. Yeah. It has to be fed. It's a big dog. It has to be trained. So it has to live with um, the herder or the, the family for a number of years. So look, I think it's a, it's a tool and it's an option that we could try out. I know that there's been a lot of discussion with uh, people like the EWT who have got an Anatolian uh, working dog oh. program and, and let's try it out. But I don't think that it's a silver bullet solution. Yeah. And I think there's a number of other things. It, it's education to people about crawling their animals at certain times yeah. of the night. That's We've right. seen a lot of success with the Herding for Health program, um, which is a Peace Parks and Conservation International mm. uh, program. where. Just crawling your animals has reduced uh, human wildlife conflict. There's a lot of knowledge and training that needs to be shared in terms of when you start to see those, those gaps under the fence or an area that's washed away, fill it in with rocks or put, put some brush packing, alert the authorities then yeah. before the animals start to move out. Yeah. Even tracks and things like that, identifying as you walk along. Brent, you said when you were walking out there, you saw fresh leopard tracks. And hyena. And hyena tracks. So it's, it's just noticing those sorts of things and it's a change of perception. I mean, the worst thing that we can do is overreact and, and think that we, we, we need to put more fences and whatever else. It's, it's a matter of trying to find that, that mutual relationship. And, and guys, I mean, you've got to understand that the last year has been incredibly difficult for everyone. Correct. The Manileti Game Reserve, the people who live in the communities there, 
I mean, the Manuleti obviously gets um, a certain amount of money from government, but that is subsidized by tourists. Mm -hmm. And we, Manuleti hasn't seen a tourist since... Mm -hmm. 12 months. 12 months. Mm -hmm. Now, that money goes through to maintaining fences, mm -hmm. anti-poaching, and everyone at the moment is doing the best they can mm -hmm. with what is available. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that even goes to everyone in the community. A lot of people who worked at the lodges yeah. are now sitting mm -hmm. at home. Yeah, some of the people now, now they've been retrenched due to this COVID issue. Yeah. So it's it's a big problem now, as you all know that COVID's a problem. And, and imagine, so now you don't have any work. You've got three cattle, cattle or goats that you've kept alive and for the last three years and they've cost you a thousand, five hundred, two thousand rand worth of feed and whatever else. And now they're dead all of a sudden. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a tough yeah. Tough thing, and and that's where a little bit of sympathy, a little bit of empathy towards both sides of the story yeah. need to happen. Like a finger pointing exercise doesn't help anyone. Yeah, yeah. I think Brent, what um, uh, Mike says, and uh, we are not fighting. No. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of, of 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 the situation, and Tulani mentioned it, that uh, you know we have conflict. But it's been compounded by the sh shadow of COVID-19 over the last 12 months. Talking about retrenchments, talking about people being furloughed, people like on half pay, etc., etc. Um, except the government service, who get 100%. Um, <laughs> that, uh, uh, that is a different problem. Anyway, yeah. um, but you think about it, and I'm going to relate another uh, uh, conflict issue which surrounded a place called Bongani Mountain Lodge, which was... I know was burnt uh, on a community owned reserve in Tetamusha in the southwestern corner of Kruger. And this happened before the leopard thing. But I read through, look at both situations and trying to gauge, you know, um, not to say that there's a threat from communities against protected areas, but people are, are, are in such a tense situation at the moment. Um, and there's reason behind why things happen. One can argue that, Toss, I'm not saying that. but. Because of COVID, if I was sitting at home, as uh, Mike was painting a picture, I don't have a job. I've got three kids, let alone wildlife. I've got three children who are starving, and I live close to a protected area, and I see an impala on the other side. Does it cross my mind that, hell, you know, I, I've got no way of, of feeding my children. Does it cross my mind to go and, and try and uh, um, source yeah. that impala? I'm not saying I'm vindicating breaking the law. Yeah. Sure. You know what I'm saying? I think well, people are under psychological stress compounded by COVID. And there are a couple of incidents, not just the Hukumuri incident, but a couple which yeah. lines have been drawn in the sand, which I think we well, uh, take cognizance of. Again, it's, it's, a, it's a flow of resources that we don't often talk about, is that there's a lot of animosity between certain uh, reserves that people have been moved off of that yeah, area historically. Yeah. And that's... That was part of your culture of going mm -hmm. and utilizing the land in a in a sustainable sort of mm -hmm. way, and and so that's a I mean that's a tough dis mm -hmm. discussion and and maybe it's part of the reason why in places like Kenya, Botswana, where there aren't any fences, mm -hmm. there isn't as much uh, focus on an individual situation of human yeah. wildlife conflict mm -hmm. because it's a bit of a give and take mm -hmm. there. And, it, and there's a really it, nice symbiosis that yeah. happens with communities. Correct. You harvest certain things, whether it be firewood or the odd animal or whatever, yeah. in the right way. In a legal way. A sort of, whether it be um, done in an organized manner or not, that, that's slightly different. But at least you're utilizing the resource mm -hmm. together. The moment that you put a fence up, sure. it, it creates mm -hmm. this, this hard Barrier. divide. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and people are going to say, well, nobody's allowed to come in and shoot an impala. Mm -hmm. And so you have the, the same, they, people on the outside have the same right to say, well, if the leopard's outside, then it's my Correct. problem. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, again, or yeah. an elephant, or yeah. a baboon, or yeah. a hippo, hippo, hippo. Or whatever. Yeah. Buffalo. Yeah. Buffalo, yeah. yeah. Porcupine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, th I think a lot of um, everyone's questions here um, from the app are all, all quite similar. So we'll go back to YouTube quickly. Is everyone stopped on you behaving now? Yeah. <laughs> um, I see people asking why, why, um, why, why aren't the communities allowed to harvest any venison and stuff? But I mean, that's uh, <laughs> well, uh, this is this is part of the the whole process that I think is starting to to become a discussion in the conservation sector is about sustainable resource use. 
Yeah. But the moment that you do anything, Kruger National Park went and got absolutely lambasted because during the drought they shot a whole bunch of, of buffalo because they recognized that there were too many for that carrying capacity. They did it in a feeding scheme and they get, gave the meat out to all the schools and they got absolutely lambasted, lambasted yeah. to say like, how dare you take our buffalo because it's a national treasure and this and that. So I think it's perspective again. I, I kind of, every time I think about this, it comes back to perspective of, if we want to conserve nature, whether it be inside a protected area, outside a protected yeah. area, whether it's the grass that you sit on uh, in your front lawn or something else, you've got to try and think of the bigger picture. You can't do it in isolation. We're never going to have these, these areas in isolation. We're not going to go back no. to 10,000 years to what it was. Yeah. And, and we just have to work with what we've got and make what we have work. Yeah. And again, so, so the, the answer to what you're saying is why can't people sort of utilize is there are processes that, that they do. Uh, there's a lot of disease risks. So, so inside the, the fence, there's foot and mouth. And, and if you bring a cloven hoof animal over the fence, there's a risk to the whole of South Africa's livestock industry. That, the beef that, industry. The yeah. beef industry. So, so we have very strict veterinary laws that, that stop that. But it's not to say that that sort of sharing of resources doesn't happen. It just happens in a different kind Correct. of way. And sometimes the, the sharing of the resource is channeled to one way and sometimes it's channeled another way. So I think if, if we can take anything out of this whole process, it's for people to try and understand the bigger picture, mm -hmm. but then people to also look at what is going on in terms of a resource sharing. Like yeah. There are a number of really good projects that are going on that are sharing those resources. Kruger's done a, a Mopani worm harvesting. Okay. They, they're selling, or not selling, they're actually giving away pepper bark trees so that people aren't having to go in and harvest them illegally. There's a lot of good things that are happening. Are happening. Correct. So there you go, Safari Sue, there's some of the solutions that you were asking about coming through. Um, and again, these things take time. You can't, was it a day? Rome wasn't built in a day. And I mean, COVID's changed the world, but slowly but surely, we all, we all have to learn and everyone has to benefit. Not only one side can't be the sole beneficiary for this, for animals to survive, for wildlife to survive, for conservation to survive, for people to survive. We need to find out. Welcome back everyone, I hope we're back. Uh, we're not 100% sure, we're having a bit of a problem with our internet um, subscri or subscription. But um, if it's not live, we'll make sure this is posted um, afterwards so everyone can see. And um, what we wanted to discuss now is that a lot of people want to help. And unfortunately, sometimes too much help can be a bad thing if it's not done in the correct manner and goes through the correct channels. Mike, you want to kick off on sort of from because you're so much so involved in the greater Kruger for a start, in terms of the uh, um, what's it, the policies and the uh, programs that are actually in place. Yeah. Maybe I think you leave it off and then. Yeah, happy, happy to finish. do so. So I mean, I think the big thing to, to start off with is uh, trying to help an individual is is difficult because you if if you donate goats or money to, to this specific family because it was Hukumuri. What about the other families that have lost animals yeah. to, yeah. Uh, lost livestock to hyena and all sorts of other things. So I would say the way for people to help is, is two ways. First thing is to learn from the, the situation and educate yourself about what's going on in the area. Um, educate yourself, look up things like the Greater Kruger Strategic Development Program, which is a an initiative that looks at the whole of the Mozambique side, the, the Kruger side, the, the um, private reserves and, and the communities on, on the, the border um, and is trying to work on this big sort of social plan um, as a whole. I think there's a number of NGOs working within there. There's the Kruger to Canyons Biosphere that has got mm -hmm. a bunch of work. WWF Keta are working there. 
Conservation South Africa and Herding for Health are working there. The Good Work Foundation are even doing some sort of private guiding work along with their, their hubs all over. Africa Foundation. Um, Elephants Alive. Elephants Alive. Yeah, Indian, yeah, yeah, EWT. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Singita sort of trust. Yeah. Fushanani, whatever. Uh, yeah, the, trusts, yeah, yeah, the Sabi yeah. San Funanani Trust. Funanani, you've, you've, yeah. you've got, so you've got a whole bunch of work that, that's going on. And I would say if you want to donate, donate through them. So what we can do, guys, is on the app, um, we will get a list of the correct NGOs and, and um, funds and trusts that are, are working on this type of stuff. And we will place it uh, on the app where, where everyone can see it. Yeah. And then, and then I think this, the second sort of thing that, that people can start to do is, is also maybe take a moment when you do read something um, to, to think about what was discussed here. Think about all the things that were written and maybe just take a moment before reposting or sending it on and creating a storm. Yeah. Um, because I think that that creates a whole lot of negative sides to it as well. So, so from my side, I think that's uh, the best way to do it. And maybe uh, just sort of leading into Tulani. Tulani's gone through a number of those different projects. He, yes. he was a business in the Funanani Enterprise Development. He's, mm -hmm. he, he's been able to uh, receive sort of um, his film training through, through Dragon Mountain. So there's a number of different ways that, that people benefit. And, and like you want to you build people. You don't want to solve a problem overnight by giving somebody four, four goats or exactly. whatever. You, you want to try and build resistance and resilience yeah. to, to the bigger problem. Yeah. So I think Max is correct. It's not all about giving people the money. Let's just give them like an experience, education that will last them to survive with their own. Rather than giving like someone money. Yeah. At the end of the day, like they will waste the money and then come back and then what if the issues it also happened to, not, to the next person? That would be a question. What about us? So I think donating to those NGOs, getting people who are dedicated to do something and come back home, help their, their families to survive, I think that would be the best, best way. And again, it's, it's setting up businesses. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think it's, you know, it's the, the old adage of uh, giving fish or teaching how to fish. Yes. Uh, as people have said, uh, from, I'll take a different perspective. Uh, for all of you out there who are looking to donate, I think uh, you can look for platforms to donate. But I want to plant a seed that uh, many of you around the world are dying to come out here. It's an expensive de destination to get here, but I think also the role of tourism, the tourism mm -hmm. dollar, is worth a huge amount. So I encourage people to as I said, donate, but on the other hand, look towards actually coming out, uh, spending your tourism dollar, dollar in Africa. Um, it can go a long way, and um, it's a powerful uh, contributor to our economy, to the African economy, and look to do that because I think that uh, your role as tourists coming out here, uh, you are socially aware, you are sustainably, uh, sustainable living aware, pose questions, but contribute and look to come out and visit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Misha, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think it's it's not just coming out to the the, the key destinations. It's about on your journey up, Correct. stopping off and buying a Coke from the local spaza shop. Misha. Rather than flying straight yeah. in Correct. and straight yeah. in. Yeah. Embrace the community. Yeah. Uh, sort of there's a number of small little lodges yeah. just on the on the outskirts. There's there's lodges that might not give you a five-star meal, but they give you an experience that no one else can beat. So, so I think those are the critical parts, is, is bring, bring your, your family, bring your dollars, Correct. bring yourself and learn while you're here. And, and, and I think the one thing, the information age, which we live in, is people are, and you guys are proof of this, a lot more educated than 25 years ago about human wildlife conflict about the the challenges that are facing the people in the villages and, and the yeah. surrounds that you know now that you can make a difference even if it is a small difference even just visiting going and getting a coke from a spaza shop going to have a look at the communities out there and a lot of the lodges do offer it but most people don't take it up take it up correct yeah. i mean I, I know i've worked at quite a few of the the very high-end lodges and the, the community tour options were there, but we've, I very seldom, I think, at one, I'm not going to say any name, uh, but at one lodge, I think I was there for two years, and I think I did one 
yeah, for community chat. But that, that's the irony to me is that uh, people have got access to all of this. People have got access to maps and, and can find out themselves via the via the via that this story happened and there's a whole lot of effort that goes into digging up the real story. Yeah. Yet yeah. You, you're not always aware of where exactly Seville B or Makrapin okay. is or okay. what the road is to the Sabi sand and who lives on the outside. And, and those, are, those are the things that I think we really need to, we, we need to immerse ourselves into being part of the ecological system that's, that's the, the protected areas aren't an ecological system on their own. The entire area, yeah, exactly. the rivers flow from the escarpment through the communities yeah. and into the protected areas. If it wasn't for those communities looking after that yeah. land, that water wouldn't flow through. Okay. And so we need to understand that there is a bigger picture here and we need to be part of that bigger picture. Yeah. Again, exactly as TDK one says, a bottom bottom up solution, Absolutely. rather than a top yeah, down agree, solution. Yeah, agreed. I think uh, far too often there is this this thing that from the top, uh, the so called inverted commas clever people, uh, talking to to down to downwards, and because but the people on the ground actually have survived, and actually uh, it needs to be turned around very often and taken into consideration um, what the local expertise and resourcefulness is and nature's a big uh, a big leveler yeah. so, so you it can is. be humbled pretty quickly yeah. when uh, a young guy that uh, has been a herder all his life yeah. will walk you through a pride of lions yeah. or a, a group of elephants yeah. or exactly. a herd of elephants or whatever yeah. quite comfortably yeah. yet he can't read or write yeah. and, and that's the the interesting thing is that 100 your your perception perception and you being clever is, is actually yeah. all yeah. relative to what you see Correct. And I, I mean, I, I'm going to quote my, my dear dad here. I've learned a lot from him over the years. But often with situations like this and solutions, we as Africans and people living in Africa actually here every day get a lot of advice mm -hmm. from people, well-meaning advice, well-meaning yeah, sure. advice. I mean, there's that, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intention. Mm -hmm. um, and just a little, a little sort of snippet. A lot of people say, let's just take Europe, it's a nice easy one, are telling people in Kenya and Zambia, Botswana, mm. South Africa, how we must look after the animals, what we must do. Mm. Do you know there's only 20,000 hectares of intact temperate forest in the whole of Old World Europe? Sure. There's 20,000 hectares. That is not even a, a, third, sec it's a third, third of the size of the Sabi Sands. A third of the Sabi Sands that is actually natural as close as it should be to what it is. Where there is, we might not do everything right, but we've got a lot more land, a lot more animals. And at the end of the day, it is great that the world feels ownership for them. But at the end of the day, they are animals. And if the people who are living here cannot benefit from them, they will not protect them. And, and that is it. And so far, outside of obviously there's some very bad things that happen from the conservation point of view in animals. But considering the way the rest of the world has decimated its wildlife, um, we're, doing, we're doing okay and yeah. we can only get better if we work together and learn from these experiences. So to put your, your numbers in, in perspective, Bushbuck Ridge area mm. has got 2 million people, mm. 80,000 head of uh, cattle, they reckon about 40,000 goats, and it's got 68,000 hectares of intact rangeland. That's, so, so that's that, amazing. That yeah. Three times more than the whole of Europe in, in a small area. Wow. And, and that's yeah. what we're trying to work with in, in, in everything that we do is, is trying to just educate that it's about the bigger picture. That yes, you've got 2 million hectares of the Kruger National Park, but it relies on outside. the outside. Yeah. That 68,000 hectares. Mm -hmm. Is where the water flows of the three major rivers that flow into the Sabi San, exactly. Manuleti, and, and the Southern Kruger National Park. And, and, and if that's not looked after, the rivers are silted, they stop flowing, the water comes, there's E. coli outbreaks and stuff. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things, guys. And, and again, take the time to do the yeah. research before you come. And there are some amazing things and amazing people in these communities that are, are not on Instagram yeah. and Facebook and are not in the public space. And a lot of the people who do a lot of the best work do it quietly. Yeah, correct. They're the unsung heroes. Yeah. And heroines. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But again, 
Thank you very much, everyone, um, for joining for us. Thank you so much, Tulani, Mike, Michelle. Pleasure. Okay, and uh, thank you guys, again, very importantly, um, for being part of this discussion and being willing to learn and, and, and listen. And as I said, this is not, it's not going to, to end here. It's not over. Um, and it's a journey. It's a journey. Yeah. And us at Paints Dog TV will definitely be continuing to help show you both sides of the picture. It's very easy to sit on one side of the fence. Yeah. Yeah. particularly in this <laughs> circumstance um, and, 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 and not look at the other side of the fence and how people live. And of course, a big thank you to Led Lenza and Rogue, um, uh, our patrons and uh, the YouTube supporters and, and, and everyone. Uh, and of course to cell phone Brian. <laughs> Can't let him get away with it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, to Charles, Vim, Dean, and the rest of the team, Yuka, everyone, thanks very much. And uh, have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday evening or morning, depending on what time zone and where you are in the world. Good night. Thanks. Cheers. First school, me and my aunt, I used to get that three at the last year. La, number three, I should go and see. Say, three pin, that was Janawa. I'm going to talk about Tinga. Say, Linga could make a if you can my jambu, seven at local like um, come lamo. Say, could you get my jambu, she came in again, I come at three at the mootilla. Yeah, I come at three at the at the mood. Say, and then. Some ceremonies were going to Okay. 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 Okay.